Hello everyone, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. With us today we have Mark Quatrock of the Blue and Gray Hospital Association. He's going to be talking about uh, Confederate battlefield medicine, Confederate trauma care. Uh, and so you're in for an excellent presentation. Uh, if you like these videos, uh, go ahead and like this video. Uh, consider sharing this video so more people can see it. And like our Facebook page to stay up to date with all the latest uh, digital content that we've been providing. Um, and if you want to support efforts like this, consider becoming a member of the museum. Um, go to civilwarmed.org support to find out more information about that. With all that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark here, and uh, you're in for a real treat. All right, thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Quatrock. I am di the director of the Blue and Gray Hospital Association. Uh, just a little bit to tell, uh, letting you know who we are. Uh, we are a living history organization. Uh, we've been active as far as an organization since 2012. Uh, we're one of the official living history groups here at the museum. Uh, we do programs here at the museum. Uh, the George Spangler Farm at the Gettys in Gettysburg, the Gettysburg Heritage Center. Um, and we're also doing educational programs, especially in the times with COVID. Uh, we are definitely doing more virtual presentations and bringing programs like this to you. Um, last time we, uh, I did a video presentation, just a recap, um, it was on the union side of trauma care and how things evolved. How did the medical, you know, doctors you know, realize that uh, there needs to be trauma care and there needs to be the creation of first aid kits. And we talked a lot about that. So before you view this video, please go back and check out part one. And you can see how everything evolved um, as far as the thinking and also how things evolved with the Union United States Army Medical Department and all of their first aid kits. Um, today, we're going to talk about part two. We're going to talk about the Confederate side. Um, now, not just the Union side, but the Confederate side. And when we talk about the Confederacy, there's a lot of myths when it comes to the Confederacy. Myths that were perpetrated by Hollywood fiction, fictional novels. Certainly, one of the big movies, as far as that created a lot of myths, was Gone with the Wind. And you saw Scarlett O'Hara in that scene where she's in Atlanta, she's walking out of the hospital, and all the wounded laying out in the field, out in the ground there at the uh, railroad depot, and a Confederate flag flying in the wind. And was that a, the national flag? No, it was the Confederate battle flag. So a lot of myths that were definitely created by both fiction and Hollywood. Um, one of the things that, you know, with the Confederacy is a lot of the records, uh, both sides kept very accurate, very meticulous records um, as far as wounded, what they came in when they came in the hospital, um, a lot of the documents, letters and everything, and a lot of the documents and letters were lost when it came to the Army of Northern Virginia. And this is because when the Confederate government evacuated Richmond after the fall of Petersburg, they burned the arsenal. Um, and the fire spread throughout the city. And unfortunately, a lot of the buildings that were used by the medical department, Confederate States Medical Department, were burned. So a lot of those records were lost. And, and in that case, nothing was really written about the Confederate side until about 20 or 30 years ago. When you got about uh, books like Doctors in Gray and a lot of the literature that's definitely coming out now. And what we realize is um, with the letters, diaries, and everything that are coming out, um, is we're seeing a different side of the story, especially when it comes to letters and documents from the Army of Tennessee and a lot of the doctors that served in what's called the Trans-Mississippi area. We're finding that it's a much different story. Um, and what we're finding is that when it comes to trauma care um, and battlefield medicine, a lot of what you're gonna see and what we're gonna talk about is similar to what we talked about in the previous video with the Letterman plan and the Letterman system. So how did this all begin? Well, first of all, when the Confederate government began after Lincoln was inaugurated in 1860, the Confederacy really didn't have an army. Um, what they had was a system of militias, and this really became the core of what would be the Confederate States Army. With not having an army, they didn't have a medical department. So they literally had to create one from scratch, you know, from right from the beginning, from the ground up. Um, so they started with a Surgeon General, four surgeons and six assistant surgeons 
And the first one was, uh, Surgeon General was David Leone. Now he only really served for a very short period of time. Um, and you know, when he left, they brought in an acting uh, Surgeon General named Charles Smith. And then they came to, the, uh, to this person, and this person would be the Surgeon General throughout the majority of the war. Um, and his name is Samuel Preston Moore. Uh, Samuel Preston Moore was a very able administrator. He was uh, a doctor in the United States Army. He had served in a lot of different areas, things, uh, places like Kansas, Missouri, Florida, Texas, uh, places where there was a lot of things going on with the Seminole Indian Wars. You had the, all the things going on in Texas. You had uh, things going on with Kansas and Missouri. You had uh, the Mexican War, which went on, um, and he served in, during the Mexican War. And he served for a bit as surgeon in, at West Point. So when um, the states, as far as the you know, first initial states started seceding, um, he left the army, he just, and he joined the, as far as the United States Army, and he joined the Confederate Army. And he would eventually become the Surgeon General of the Confederate States Medical Service. So when Preston Moore took over, he had a lot of problems right from the beginning. And as we said, there was really no organized medical department. So he had to literally create one from scratch. And it was not a department that was capable at the time of dealing with the large amount of casualties that they, you know, that would, they would have at the beginning, of, especially at the beginning of the war. Doctors back then knew about gunshot wounds. They knew a lot of different things. They knew about anatomy. They knew about uh, how to use a microscope and a stethoscope. They knew how to, about the blood. They knew um, about theory and practice. And they knew about surgical procedures. But the one thing they didn't know about is how do you deal with mass casualties? Um, you know, large amount of wounded, how do you take them from point A and evacuate them off the field and get them to a general hospital? Uh, there was not enough medical personnel in the beginning. Um, so uh, you had, when the war started, the U.S. Army Medical Department had a little over 100 surgeons to handle 16,000 um, soldiers, officers and soldiers in the United States Army. 23 of them left, um, who were Southerners, when their state seceded, they left and they joined the Confederate States Medical Service. Um, when also, in trying, you know, as far as the shortage of medical personnel, they looked to people within the ranks. Um, one of them in particular was Hunter Holmes McGuire. When Hunter Holmes McGuire started, um, he was a private, and eventually he became a uh, surgeon and medical director of the, of the uh, Second Corps of the Army in Northern Virginia. We're going to talk a little more about him. Um, they had a supply problem, especially with some of the drugs that were being used, things like quinine. Quinine was considered to be the miracle drug of the Civil War. Um, definitely had shortages on that. There was no organized system of evacuation. How do you evacuate people from the field, like I said, to a general hospital? Um, not enough transportation, especially when it comes to railroads. The South had railroads, but they didn't have it compared to the North. The North had more tracks, more gauge um, compared to the South, and this would, would be a problem. And there was not enough general, what we call general hospitals at the outset. So the supply problem, what were the, some of the pro supply uh, problems that impacted trauma care? Well, first of all, was medical instruments. What medical instruments they had was basically if you were a doctor prior to the war, you brought, may have brought your own kit with you. You uh, smuggled through the lines as far as crossing, you know, as far as inter you know, inter smuggling through, you know, as far as cross trade through the lines. You had, of course, the blockade where, you know, as far as supplies were being brought in from England and France, they would send them down to places like Bermuda and the Bahamas. Uh, the Confederates would send fast steamers down there. They would load the ships up as far as these steamers and then send them back up and run through the naval blockade. Um, also, a lot of capturing of medical supplies, captured kits, um, especially, you know, medicines um, that were captured as far as if you captured in a uh, Union supply base, um, you know, medical supplies were highly prized, and that was and that was definitely important. Bandage and linen material. Believe it or not, you know, it's surprising that here you are. The Confederacy is, you know, cotton is king. They had plenty of cotton. The problem was, they didn't have enough textile mills to turn cotton into bandage material. So this would present a problem, and they worked around it. And we're going to talk about one of the ways in which they worked around it. Um, no organized system of appropriating and distributing supplies, both in the field and to general hospitals. And the last thing was they had no first aid kits whatsoever. So this was something that definitely they had to create. 
So when we talk about no system evacuations, unlike the you know, US Army Medical Department, which we came up with a Letterman plan, um, in the beginning with the Confederate Medical Service, they too did not have any field stations. They used an old system that was used, what we call regimental hospitals. Um, they had no work in the ambulance corps, and again, the railroad system was not enough, you know, not enough to handle um, as far as the, the needs, you know, as far as transporting the wounded. So what was the regimental hospital system? So for every regiment, um, you know, in the Confederate Army, you basically had, you know, a, and a regiment was a thousand men. You had 10 companies in a regiment. So for every regiment, you had a surgeon who held the rank of major. You had an assistant surgeon who was a captain. Now, an assistant surgeon, both the surgeon and assistant surgeon were doctors. Um, these guys had, you know, as far as may have gone through medical school prior to the war. Um, and the assistant surgeon was a captain. You had a hospital steward. And just like the Union Army, the hospital steward in the Confederate Army was literally the workhorse. He was the pharmacist. He did all the, you know, as far as keeping the records. Um, so he had, a, you know, a lot of different jobs that he would definitely be doing. I um, mean, he had to learn how to read and write, and he had to know Latin, and that was very, very important. And then you had a private, and an orderly was basically, um, if this person here was a convalescing soldier, um, we would say, okay, you know, you're an orderly, you know, you know, you can help us out, or you can help as far as bandaging, uh, whatever. So um, that's how a lot of, you know, as far as orderlies were used. So when it came to the surgeons and assistant surgeons who were commissioned, even though they were medical staff officers, they were commissioned in the Confederate Cavalry. And the reason being is because of the need for fodder for horses and being able to requisition fodder for horses, uh, for their horses. So when, the, when battles are going on, you had first battle of Bull Run, uh, you had um, Shiloh, and Shiloh was really the eye opener for both sides because up until then, both sides really, you know, were thinking that this war, you know, this wasn't gonna be a long war. It was only gonna last maybe six months to three months, maybe six months to even a year, um, and that's it. And for the Confederacy, it's one big battle, and you know, we're gonna win our independence. But Shiloh in April of 1862 was really the eye opener. <coughs> and when it came to wounded, they had you know, literally over 20,000 wounded in two days. It was more wounded than Washington had in eight years of fighting the American Revolution. And both sides realized then that it really is gonna be a long war and we need to plan for the, for the long haul. Um, what really, you know, as far as with Moore, realized that they really needed to do something and create something was the Battle of Williamsburg, uh, May 5th of 1862. This was part of the Peninsula, came, the Peninsula Campaign um, that uh, George McClellan, when he was marching uh, the Army of the Potomac up the James Peninsula to try and capture Richmond. Um, there was a battle in front of what is today Williamsburg, um, and they ran into the same situation. Wounded were poorly treated. There was no evacuation system. Wounded were left out for days, um, you know, as far as treating soldiers and getting them to a general hospital. So Moore realized there had to be something. There, they had to create a system. And he comes out with a memo and he sends it to all of his medical officers, calling for the establishment of a system where you had what were called field infirmary corps, a corps of field, you know, field infirmary corps, you had a brigade hospitals, a system of brigade hospitals. So no longer are you using regimental hospitals. Now every regiment would be part of a much larger organization called a brigade. And what they would do is they would take all of the people as far as operating surgeons and they would put them together and they would bring all of their supplies together, or centralize everything, um, and then you would have a chief surgeon as far as in the brigade, the senior surgeon, in overall charge, and then creating an ambulance system. <coughs> now, with this, the, the problem with the number of medical officers, Moore also called for the creation of a reserve corps. Uh, basically, you know, having officers who could be called upon in a crisis to try and deal with the problem with the, the n numbers of doctors that they had. So when it came to the, the system called for by Moore, Lafayette Gill, Lafayette Gill was the medical director of the Army of Northern Virginia, pretty much throughout the, throughout the majority of the war. Um, he's gonna take the first part of this, which is the creation of a field infirmary corps, um, and also as far as the brigade hospital system. 
Uh, Lafayette Guild was a doctor prior to the war. He served in the regular army. And again, when his state seceded, he joined the Confederacy and became the medical director of the Army of Northern Virginia. So what are field infirmaries? Just like the Letterman system where you had field dressing stations, you had what, with the Confederacy what are called field infirmaries. Field infirmary, infirmaries were set up about 50 to 100 yards behind the lines. You had assistant surgeon. Now, one of the questions we had in the previous video, video was, what's the duty of an assistant surgeon? Well, this is the first duty. Taking care of the field infirmary or in the uni Union Army, the United States Army, you're taking care of the field dressing station, manning the dressing stations. Also, you also took care of sick call, you know, as far as in the camps. So you went around and anybody that reported uh, sick for duty, um, you took care of them as well. So when it came to these field infirmary corps, you had an assistant surgeon and you had an orderly. And just like the US Army, the US, United States uh, Medical Department and the Letterman Plan, they did what we know today as triage, where back then it was called sorting the wounded. So how did they sort the wounded? Basically the same way. Um, anybody that was slightly wounded, you performed basic first aid. So here's where first aid kits, definitely the need for first aid, first aid kits arose. Um, you know, in order to be able to do basic first aid, stitch them up, bandage them up, boom, they're back out in the field again. Mortally wound, moderately wounded, your idea is to stabilize them. You know, treat them, stabilize them, get them back to a field hospital. Um, same thing with the severely wounded. So you're not really doing much at a field infirmary with these, uh, with these people. It's bandaging them up, stopping the bleeding, using a tourniquet or using um, as we'll see, uh, some drugs that were used that, that created clotting, caused clotting, um, stopped the bleeding, and then getting them back to a field hospital. For those that were mortally wounded, especially the ones that were had very serious head, chest, or abdomen wounds, like with the U.S. Army Medical Department and the field system, you're going to segment them aside, you're going to put them underneath a tree called the dying tree, you're going to give them enough morphine, opium, to make them feel comfortable, they stayed there and they pretty much died there. If they were alive by the time you had gotten through all of your wounded, treating all of your wounded, if they were still alive, you may have called back for them. But for the most part, they stayed there and they died there. So what did they use as far as first aid kits? Well, when I first started in the hobby, um, which was uh, as far as doing medical in 2000, year 2000, I've been in the hobby now about 30 years. Um, and I've started, you know, as far as with doing Civil War medicine in the year 2000. When, when I started, basically, as far as, you know, there was a settler called Dixie Leatherworks. And he came out with a kit called the Harris, uh, Harris case. And we talked about this in the last video. And I'm seeing a lot of Confederates that are carrying this. And I'm thinking, is this something that they carried? And I realized, you know, talking to people and especially talking to people like uh, Terry Hambrecht and John O'Neill, who are both really subject matter experts. They're here at the museum. Um, and I'm asking them, did they really carry this? And the answer is no. So I think you're thinking, well, what did they carry? And if you look at Chisholm's manual, um, there was a doctor, a Confederate doctor, a very famous Confederate doctor in the, in the Confederate Medical Service, named John Julius Chisholm. He's going to write a medical manual. It's called the Manual of Military Surgery in 1864. And it, it, he talks about a hospital knapsack. And just that the hospital knapsack, which was issued to Confederacy, um, basically what they did was they took an existing design for an enlisted knapsack, and they made it deeper, wider, and longer um, in order to carry a lot of material. Now, and, and also on top of that knapsack, would be a horseman's valise or a cavalry valise. So in doing the research, what I did was um, also, you know, as far as with the knapsacks, trying to figure out, did they really carry them? We just not only have this, but if you look at Kevin Pollock's book on the Battle of Shepherdstown, he talks a lot about people, you know, as far as orderlies carrying knapsacks um, when it came to the Confederate medical, uh, Confederate service that was out in the field at Antietam. So that got me thinking, we need something, you know, as far as having something built. So I went to a person, a sutler today, his name is Paul Lopes. And I went to him and asked him to create the knapsack. And right now there's no pictures of what a knapsack, one of those knapsacks look like. And 
you know, so based on just the description that's in the Chisholm manual, this is what we came up with. So you have, this is what it looks like, you know, on a table or it could be carried on a person's back. And like the knapsacks that were used in the US Army, this was designed not only to wear on a person's back and open up while they're wearing it on their back, but it's also designed to take apart and lay it on the ground and set up a station. Um, so this is what it looks like when it's empty, and this is what it looks like when it's full. Um, this is the knapsack, and it, as you can see, it carries, it really carries a lot of material. Um, we're talking about bandage material, we're talking about uh, material used for absorbent or packing, and what they used was basically, both sides, was they used two things. First is what they call lint. And lint is basically the same bandage material, material bandages are uh, made of, they would take that material and they would scrape it, and it's those scrapings that they would use, they would form it into a clump and use it for packing. Um, they would also use that same material as far as bandage material, they would take the strings off it, and then again, use, you know, wet it, use it, clump it together, and that's what we call Sharpe. Um, now also what they, you know, in the manual, the Chisholm manual, what they realized is that cotton was a much better absorbent. You know, and one of the things they used was raw cotton. Now the problem with raw cotton is it's greasy. Um, so what they did was they boiled, to get rid of the grease, they boiled it. And they found that their rate of staph infections were low uh, as far as um, boiling. Now what they didn't realize is that they were sterilizing and, and that would come years later after the war when they, you know, were talking about sterilization and boiling and everything. But that's one of the things they did. When it came to suture material, they didn't have enough silk suture or silver wire that the Union Army had. So what did they use? They had to use the next best thing, something that worked in the past and that they had plenty of it, and that's horsehair. Um, and what they did was, now horsehair trying to get it on a surgical needle um, was very stiff. So what they did again was to soften it up, they boiled it. Um, and the same thing holds true with the bandage material. Now they didn't launder the bandage material, what they did was they boiled it. And same thing holds true. What they're finding is that their rate of staph infections were low, really, you know. And this is de definitely something that, you know, they, you know, this would go on. Now there's one story, um, going back here, as far as what drugs did they carry in the knapsack? Well, basically when you look at it in the field, this is it. You know, you have sweet oil, with the, which they use for bandaging. You have what's called perchloride of iron, which was used for hemorrhaging, stop, you know, clotting, stopping the bleeding. You had painkillers, which was morphine. Um, you know, as far as for a painkiller, they had chloroform, and chloroform was really used as a last resort. You know, if they had to do an operation out in the field, it was done as a last resort. Um, otherwise, they're going back to a field hospital when they're doing an operation. And the last thing was brandy. Now, brandy was not used, unlike the myth, like you know, movies like The Horse Soldier where you know, you're swigging the, the bottle of whiskey and, and you know, you're using it as a painkiller or you pour it on the wound and you're using it as an antiseptic. No, that didn't even happen. What they used brandy for was as a stimulant. Um, if you were in any kind of shock, what they did was they gave you, you know, definitely gave you a couple of teaspoons or you know, a dose of brandy. So that's the field, that's it. When it came to sick call, it was a different story because now you're dealing with a lot of other things. <coughs> Not just battlefield wounds, you're dealing with disease. And like the Union, you know, like the Union Army, disease was the number one killer of soldiers during the war. Um, and typhoid, dysentery, and diarrhea was definitely the number one killers. So what did they have? The things like powdered alum, spirits of ammonia, anodyne, brandy, uh, laudanum, tincture of opium, opium. Now opium was not just used as a painkiller. What they found was opium was used for great free dysentery and diarrhea. Because in addition to relieving pain, a side effect of opium was uh, constipation, creating constipation. Now what they found was as more people were taking opium, um, more and more, you know, just to you know, feel comfortable, they were getting addicted to it. So this is where you have a lot of the old soldier's disease and people becoming drug addicts. <clears throat> so you have acetate of lead, nitrate of silver. So these were all the things that definitely um, were used. So you know, not only did you use this knapsack out in the field, you carried it into the camp, with you <clears throat> doing sick call. Now here, there is one story that we have to talk about. Um, in 
Two years ago, with the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, Matt Atkinson did a program for PCN, um, the anniversary walk, and it was on the Joe, Dav Jeff Joe Davis Brigade. Joe Davis was the nephew of Jefferson Davis, um, and the Joe Davis Brigade fought in two, on, on the first day um, where they got caught in the unfinished railroad cut, and on the third day with Pickett's Charge. Um, there was one soldier in particular in a story that he talked about, and that was the story of Jeremiah Gage. Jeremiah <clears throat> was born in Mississippi. He was a student of the University of Mississippi. When the war began, he joined the 11th Mississippi Volunteers and joined, you know, became a member of Company A. Company A of the 11th Mississippi was known as the University Grays. These were all students who at one time were students of the University of Mississippi. Um, and he enlisted and he joined. At the Battle of Gettysburg, when all that bombardment was going on prior to Pickett's charge, um, where the 11th Mississippi was, where, is, where, is, where the Mississippi Monument is today on Confederate Avenue. Jeremiah Gage was out in the field there. He gets hit by an artillery shell, and the shell really does a lot of damage. Um, literally almost tore his arm off, but also what it did was um, it really opened up his, his abdomen area, exposing basically his abdomen, his pelvis, and a lot of the organs that were there. He realized this wound was mortal. It's a mortal wound, and even if he saw a doctor, the doctor's going to consider it to be a mortal. So what he does is he goes to a field infirmary station. He finds a field infirmary station in the field. He goes to a doctor, and he says to the doctor, doctor, I'm dying. Can you give me something to make me feel comfortable um, you know, until I pass away? And what he did was... Um, he went to his knapsack bearer, and we actually know the name of the guy, which is Jim Roll, and he pulls out, the doctor pulls out a two-ounce bottle of what's called black drop. Now, I'm sitting there thinking, when I hear about this and I'm listening to this presentation, I'm sitting there thinking, never heard of black drop before. What is that? So I contacted a man who today is really the subject matter expert on, on Civil War pharmacy, and that's Dr. Guy Hasegawa. And I said to Dr. Hasegawa, what is black drop? And he said it, it's, it was a drug that was primarily imported, that the Confederates imported overseas. And it's another name for it is called vinegar of opium. It is a very, very potent form of opium, more potent than laudanum. Um, and this is what they gave, you know, the doctor gave Jeremiah, gave him um, basically a tablespoon of this black drop along with water, uh, made him feel comfortable. And then he pretty much died there. Before he died, he actually penned a letter, which is today um, located at the University of Mississippi. Um, he penned a letter to his mother uh, prior, to, prior to his passing. But this was a very, very interesting story that not only here's a drug that was used that not really pe much people know about it, but also reinforced the idea that the Confederates were using these knapsacks. Not that case that's over there, um, but they were definitely using these knapsacks out in the field. Now, also in addition to the knapsacks, they had haversacks. This is one style of haversack that was used during the war. Um, the nice part about this one is it's, you got plenty of pockets that you definitely carry a lot of material, organize it, um, you can reach in, grab it, and just go. So what were some of the things that they, kept and they carried in here? Things like a pocket surgical kit that you see at the end of the table, a stethoscope. This is the stethoscope that was used by both sides during the war. It's what we call a manoral stethoscope. Um, this was primarily used. Tourniquets. Now, basically, tourniquets that were used, you're basically going to see two different style of tourniquets. You're going to see, this is the basically one of the main ones you're going to see. This is called a field tourniquet. Basically, it's a strap with a buckle. You're going to put it through the buckle, tighten it up, you know, and, and put pressure on the pressure point. The another one is called a pettit style tourniquet, which was more of a hand crank. You put the strap through the buckle, you tighten the hand crank, and that applies a pressure on the pressure point. So for an assistant surgeon, a doctor um, who's out in this field infirmary, this is something he's definitely, definitely going to carry. Um, so again, this is one style of, of haversack. So if you're a reenactor trying to find officer haversacks, especially used by the Confederacy, um, Dixie Leatherworks used to sell them. Now there's really two good places to go. Um, one is Dell's Leatherworks. Dell sells an ha officer haversack that was used by both sides, both Union and Confederates. Um, and also you have um, Brian Merrick's, Merrick's Custom Leather, um, that definitely makes officer haversacks. 
Now, in addition to haversacks, Chisholm also calls for an, an, an haversack, an, an extra haversack to be carried. So that same person carrying that, that backpack, as far as knapsack, he's also carrying an, an Listedman's haversack with some extra bandages and lint and other material that's definitely needed. Um, so, and then as far as canteens. Now, we talked a little bit in the last video with a kidney bean canteen. Now, with the Confederacy, really we haven't seen much pictures as far as them carrying the can style of canteen like that. So, for the most part, ideally, I mean, these are two style canteens that were definitely used by the Confederacy. They also had a, what's called a tinned rum canteen that was used, but the one here is called a gardener canteen. This is a wood, wood canteen. The other one is a smooth side canteen um, that basically has a, like a jean covered cloth on it. Uh, and these were definitely used. Carry water out in the field, not just for yourself, but for the wounded um, as well. So we talked about Lafayette McGill. He organizes the first part. We talked about the field infirmary. Now we're talking about the second part of this, which is the ambulance system. And the person that really was the, the mover as far as the ambulance system that was used was Hunter Holmes McGuire. Uh, McGuire was the medical director of the 2nd Corps of the Army Major in Northern Virginia. We know him pretty much as Stonewall Jackson's personal physician. When Stonewall Jackson was wounded at the Battle of Chancellorsville, Hunter Holmes McGuire is going to uh, perform the amputation. He's going to treat him. After Chancellorsville, he's going to continue on to be the uh, medical director for generals like uh, Richard Yule and Jubal Early, um, pretty much for the end of the war. And he's going to organize this ambulance system. Um, so as far as the ambulance system, really, this is the ambulance that was used. One of the things, disadvantages that the Confederacy had is they didn't have enough of the ambulance style ambulances that the Union Army would be using. Things like the Wrecker Ambulance or the Wheeling Ambulance, ambulances that had springs underneath them that when you're going over dirt roads, especially in places like Virginia or Tennessee, that you know if you're going over dirt roads, especially when you have wounded in the back, it takes that edge off the bump, uh, bumps when you're going over things. Um, so what they, this is just one style, a style of the ambulance that was used. This is the cot that was used. Uh, basically, as far as a stretcher, you can fold the legs out to not only be a stretcher, but also a cot. Um, as far as stretcher bearers go, excuse me, um, just like the US, you know, the Letterman system, they too had a way in which to distinguish stretcher bearers. And the way in which they distinguished them was basically a band like this. It can either go around your arm or around your hat. This is a print from Don Triani, and uh, he calls the Confederate Medical Service. And you can see, okay, you can see definitely right here, you can see that, that band as far as that ambulance corps band. And this is how they distinguish uh, stretcher bearers, you know, out in the field. Um, the ambulance corps was pretty much run by the quartermaster department when it came to the Confederate Medical Service. So field hospitals, once you evacuated wounded off the field, if it's something that it's, like I said, moderately or severely wounded, they're going back to a field hospital. Now hospitals started out just like with the US Army, you know, Letterman plan, they started out as brigade hospitals, but later they became division hospitals. So those brigades, um, when it came to the Confederate Army, you had five brigades in a division at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. So for all those brigades, they formed a division hospital. And this division hospital would be pretty much a permanent hospital. And the reason being is that one of the problems, especially in the Army of Northern Virginia, they ran into was what was called return to duty. So you treat somebody that's in a hosp hospital, you send them back to a general hospital, um, and what happens? Well, first of all, you're going to have a diet that's a lot better than what you have out in the field. Um, places like Chimborazo Hospital, which had their own, uh, which was the largest hospital of the Civil War located in Richmond. They had 8,000 hospital beds. Um, they had its own brewery, they town, its own bakery. Um, so you're eating fresh bread, you're eating, your diet is much better than what the normal Confederate soldiers diet is. You have female nurses um, and you're living basically high in the, you know, life is good. Do I really want to go back? Um, and especially as time goes on, you know, people wanting to return home. So what they did was they formed, they kept the division hospitals and they kept them permanent try and treat the wounded in the field as much as they could before sick as much as they could before sending them back to a you know a general hospital so how did the general hospital work unlike the US army medical department where your hospitals were were permanent 
They were stationary, they were permanent. Places like Satterley Hospital in, in Philadelphia, where you had a person in charge, a surgeon in charge, who reported directly to a surgeon general. Um, one of the things that the Confederacy came up with was a system of hospitals. So where you had not only in each army you had a medical director, but what they did was they basically divided the Confederacy into districts. And whatever army was in that particular district, they signed a medical officer, a, you know, a surgeon, a chief surgeon, that would run that whole general hospital system. So for the army in the east, the army in northern Virginia, if we're talking about the Battle of Gettysburg, so what they did was when Lee's army retreated, they took as much of the wounded as they could with them through, you know, taking them back to Virginia, ones that they couldn't have left behind in Gettysburg. When the army, <clears throat> when these wounded came across the Potomac, they had what were called, the first point was receiving hospitals, and that's this one here in Winchester or Stanton here. Um, and what they would do is they would come to the receiving hospitals and they would communicate to the hospitals in Richmond um, I have so many wounded, how many hospital beds do you have? And they would say, well, you know, one hospital would say, well, I've got five beds that are available. And then they would ship them um, to these particular hospitals. If they didn't have enough or there was a problem or if they didn't have transportation available, what they did was they set up these wayside hospitals where they would stay there. And most of these wayside hospitals, a lot of them were hotels. Um, one of them is still in existence today as a, as a museum. It's a place called Gordonsville. It's the Exchange Hotel. Uh, today it's a museum. Uh, and they would send them there. They would, you know, just convalesce until transportation was available or there were beds available that they could ship them to, these, uh, to, the, to Richmond. Also, Lynchburg, which is down the bottom of the page, was not only a, uh, a wayside hospital, it was also used as a general hospital. So if you're a Jeff, John, um, Longstreet fan, when he was wounded at the Battle of the Wilderness, the first place he went to was Lynchburg. Uh, went down to Lynchburg before he went up to Richmond um, to recover. So and this is basically how the hospital system worked. And it resembles, and if you look at it, it resembles the hospital system that we have today. Um, when you have networks of hospitals, places like uh, Penn Medicine, or you have uh, you know, Tower Health and where I live, where you have an administrator who oversees this whole network, and you've got six or seven hospitals that are in this network or in this chain and it resembles much of the modern health network that we have today. So if we compare the two systems, if we compare the Letterman system versus the Confederate system, first of all, the Letterman system, as we mentioned last, last time, had called for an organized system of supply. Having medical warehouses or setting up supply depots close to the front. You had picked doctors to serve as administrators. Your experienced surgeons were operating surgeons uh, that they picked as your operating surgeons an organized ambulance corps, and then the chain of evacuation. Well, if you look at it from the Confederate side, pretty much did about the same. Um, with, the conf with the supply system that they had, they basically did the same thing they did with their general hospital system. They organized the Confederacy into districts, assigned what were called a me medical purveyor or supply officer. Whatever army was in that area, that supply officer would take care of supplying that army. Um, doctors assigned as administrators, your operating surgeons as time went on, they became experienced surgeons. Um, an ambulance system and also a chain evacuation. So if we look at this, who had the better part? Well, when it came to an organized system of supply, you know, definitely having the supply warehouses, again, the Confederacy did what they could with the supplies that they had. Uh, and what limited manufacturing they had when it came to chloroform, and one of the myths is soldiers bit the bullet. No, 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 it didn't happen, even especially on the Confederate side. Both sides had plenty of chloroform. They had created medical laboratories, uh, one of which was in Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. Um, and they, you know, have definitely had plenty of chloroform. And for the South, they primarily used chloroform because it was more effective than ether and also was safer than ether. Um, ether, one very, you know, serious drawback with ether is that ether was combustible. When you're operating, and especially operating at night, you're using candle lanterns, you didn't want to get ether fumes anywhere near a, an open flame. Um, and that's one of the things. So when it came to you know, administrators, same thing. Ambulance system, if you look at this, who had the better ambulance system? It's going to be the Letterman system. Um, because of the fact that the Letterman system with the ambulance corps, the ambulance corps was under direct control of the medical department, and also was a lot more organized. A lot more organized um, and if having that that control helped a lot. Um, 
And as far as the chain of evacuation was basically the same. So if you look at this pretty much, and if you look at the general hospital system, if you're looking at the Letterman system versus the Confederate system, the Confederates really had the better system. Because one of the advantage, the things with the Letterman system and the general hospital system is that, um, and they ran into this problem with the Battle of Gettysburg, is that hospitals became overloaded. Um, and it happened at the Battle of Gettysburg. When you look at Satterley Hospital, um, Satterley, again, was the largest hospital in the Union Army, in, in the United States Army, during the war. And when the Battle of Gettysburg happened, in July of 1863, they had 1,000 patients. In August of 1863, they had over 6,000. Now, this was a hospital that had capacity of about 4,500, that could handle 4,500. They were overloaded. Whereas this, you have more, with the Confederacy, you have more better control um, as far as you know, not trying to overload your hospitals. Also, if you look at the West, the Western theory as far as the Army of Tennessee, and you read the accounts by Samuel Stout, and there's a book in the, in the, uh, in the bookstore and that's here in the museum uh, of a doctor named Samuel Stout. Samuel Stout was the doctor in charge of the general hospital system that fell uh, into with the Army of Tennessee. And if you look at his hospital system, his hospitals were mobile, um, that they could literally pack up and move to different locations. Um, and this came in very handy, especially when Sherman's marching through Atlanta, marching to Atlanta, marching through Georgia, you know, to Savannah and the Carolinas. Literally being able to pick up and move your hospital, move your wounded, um, was very, very advantageous. When the war ended, even though the, the quartermaster department pretty much fell apart, one of the things that definitely in this book is, you know, Stout is points out is that when Appomattox, when Appomattox happened, even though they lost some supplies, they still had enough equipment for 60 hospitals, and that's how many hospitals Stout handled or was in charge of, to be able to set up and treat the wounded. And that's pretty amazing. That definitely, definitely is pretty amazing. So there are definite advantages, um, and there are definitely some drawbacks uh, when you come to the letterman, you know, as far as both systems. But both systems were definitely very, very effective. Um, and if you look at the Gettysburg campaign, just as an example, of how effective this system was. Look at the number of wounded that Lee had, how many people he took across the Potomac. And then look at the Overland campaign and see how many people he has for the start of the Overland campaign. Much of the people that come back, as far as in the ranks, were people that were wounded at Gettysburg. So this system was really, despite its problems, it was definitely a very effective system. And it starts right here, the first point of contact, with the field infirmary. So as far as, uh, wound, uh, not only as far as looking at the system, let's look at the drugs that were used. If you look at the drugs, like we said in the last video, what evolved as far as the final case that the US Army would use is the Coolidge case. These are the drugs that were carried in the Coolidge case. Again, things that were used to treat, you know, as far as hemorrhaging, bandaging, lint, uh, you know, as far as painkillers, you know, stop the bleeding, you know, you've got you know, things to treat dysentery and diarrhea. They took what was considered to be the most essential drugs and that's what they used. Here, if we're looking at a field infirmary, um, again, four drugs and that's basically it. That's all you need um, for what they were, you know, what the purpose was and what they were doing out in the field. Um, so, you know, one of the things, you know, um, there was a presentation I had heard where a person who was doing a program on Civil War trauma, and he said basically, well, they weren't able to do much. Both sides were able to do a lot with what they had available as far as drugs, material, um, as far as the first aid kits that were used, as far as the knowledge that they had that they were trained, these were doctors that had a medical education, um, not the medical education that we have today, but they were very knowledgeable for the time period that they were living in. Um, and they knew what, you know, what basically worked and what was needed. So in conclusion, if we look at both the Letterman system and the Confederate Medical Service, we're using aspects of these, these two things as far as plans that were used by both the Letterman plan, we're still using it today in even our modern medical service, or our military service, with how wounded are evacuated, especially when you talk about what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and today, the first point of contact when you are a wounded soldier in the military, today's military, it's actually your partner, your, your comrade, who's got a tourniquet and a small first aid kit. 
you know, to your medic that's in the, you know, medic to your cash units, you know, your combat area surgical hospitals to your way hospitals, which is Germany, uh, to today your general hospital, which is Walter Reed Hospital. Um, and even in this, the modern medical service today, you know, like I said, the modern health systems, the equipment that was that's used today by our both our military and our civilian emergency medical services, they've gone uh, back full circle, um, and they're using everything from knapsacks to over-the-shoulder bags to uh, you know a lot of different equipment that was that was created back in the time of the Civil War that they're using today, uh, and that's basically. The conclusion of the program. So, I want to take this opportunity to thank not only my group, the Blue and Gray Hospital Association, but also John Lestray and the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I want to thank him for the opportunity of being able to do programs like these. Um, and if you like the videos, and please, you know, like I said, before you view this video, please go back and view part one and uh, the, uh, the video that I did, and also all the other videos that the museum has done and we have done, um, as far as our YouTube page as well. Um, you know, a lot of different things coming. Museum is definitely have a lot of videos and we want to keep these things going. So please uh, like the museum's page, check out the website, check out our website and our Facebook page. If you liked our Facebook page, like that. Um, and a lot more is coming. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Until next time.